three, two, one, and now we get to do that awkward moment where we wait for Facebook to catch up with us. All right, I think we are live now. Oh, so let's see. Live on Facebook. All right, uh, so we'll wait for everybody to figure out we're live and join us for just a second. And in the meantime, I'll pretend like I uh, don't have to text my wife to bring me a bottle opener. <laughs> that's live now, so that's just in the ether. Um, no, it's funny. We've been doing this. Um, I've been doing this sort of uh, tradition every episode where I try to find something to drink that relates to whatever it is I'm talking about. So last week, everybody was from the UK. So I was drinking scotch I bought in London. Uh, I just happened to have this bottle of beer still in the fridge. <laughs> so I thought, nothing better than a Yeti Imperial Stout to uh, to talk Bigfoot. So that's what we're going to drink today. Uh, excellent. Yeah, oh, and me and Stouts. And of course, I'm drinking it out of my uh, family business beer, which is out of Austin. Uh, that's the guys from Supernatural, the guy that uh, now runs that brewery. Oh, right on. Yeah. Everything comes back to Monster Hunters eventually. Uh, so, uh, I see we've got a few people on, so I guess let's get started. Welcome to another Freaky Fridays with me, James Corbin. Uh, the only reason that I put on pants anymore during these quarantines. Um, I'm super excited about this episode. A lot of these early episodes, I've just been interviewing kind of friends and, and family people I'm very, very close to. Um, and now apparently I am um, big enough that I'm starting to sit down with people that, that I study and respect and kind of follow in the footsteps of. Uh, so joining me tonight is Ken Gerhardt, uh, cryptozoologist, Bigfoot hunter, uh, all around famous uh, sort of paranormal TV personality. Um, Lord, you've been on, on more TV shows, I think, than I can list, right? Unexplained Mysteries, uh, Monster Hunter, is that right? Monster Quest. Monster Quest, I was getting them wrong, right. And then the, um, uh, the, the Legend Show, and I've seen you chase after Chupacabras and the Loch Ness Monster, and of course, uh, my favorite book, which we'll talk about today, is Ken Gerhardt's Essential Guide to Bigfoot. Uh, I see our regular fans kind of jumping on, so Big Icky is here. Uh, Christina from Ireland says hey there, so we've got our Irish contingent already in the comment section. Um, but real briefly, I'll, before I just kind of cut you loose, because I know we've got limited time, I want to dive right into it. Uh, I, I had the pleasure of meeting you three years ago uh, in 2017 at the East Texas Bigfoot Conference. Um, and that's relevant to me. That date will stick in my head for a few reasons. Um, October 7th is actually my birthday, so it was my wife's birthday present to me that year. Uh, but also that was the year uh, Tom Petty had just passed, uh, right before that conference happened. He died like just a few days before. Uh, so I know most people really only ever see me kind of from the neck up in these videos, uh, but I am wearing my Bigfoot shirt here that I picked up at the conference uh, which reads, Nightfall will be coming soon. So there's our Tom Petty nod as well. Uh, but I got to meet you and Lauren Coleman and David Weatherly and, and Lyle Blackburn and, and a whole bunch of other people who were kind enough to sign this poster behind me. Um, but you had just, either you just released or it was the first time I'd seen it, a, a book on winged humanoids. Uh, and that was it. That was all I needed to see. Um, I love those sorts of really, really, really out there myths. And um, maybe we'll talk about um, Mothman just a little bit. Hold on, I've got one. Oh, can we turn Ken up a little is my technical note there. So you might just have to shout at us, Ken. Yeah, everybody else turn up your volume and, uh, and we'll go from there. Uh, but yeah, so that was the first introduction I'd had to your work is the encounters with winged humanoids. Uh, read it cover to cover before we had driven back to Louisiana. Uh, and I think Thank this you. is your most recent, right? This just came out this year, uh, The Essential Guide to Bigfoot. Uh, I, I have copy number 54, I think, uh, of the first edition printing. Uh, but my basic review is this. If, if there are any UFO uh, lovers or, or any sort of uh, folks like that out there, uh, in 2014, 
uh, Richard Nolan released a uh, the UFOs for the 21st century mind. And I think both in you know UFOlogy and in, in cryptozoology, we're getting to the point where it's becoming such a subject of interest uh, that for some of my guests, if they're wanting to jump into the subject right away, uh, the books you have to that are you have to have read that you're kind of assumed to know that list is so long now um, that I feel like almost every major paranormal subject needs a book like this needs a primer where if you're new to it read this book it'll give you the basics you'll kind of catch up with everybody else that's been doing this for 50 years uh, and it's a great place to jump off kind of to do further research on your own uh, so so really credit to that. Um, I'm, I'm going to spare. I'm going to spare you the questions about tell us, uh, you know, how you got into Bigfoot hunting and and everything else because that's in the first chapter of the book. Go buy Ken's book. Uh, you'll get to hear all of his uh, early life story there. Um, yeah, but I, I want to get right into it. So um, don't listen to any other interview I've ever done because you know, <laughs> everybody, everybody always asks me how did you get into this, which is a fair question. It's interesting, but right. any interview I've done, you, you'll hear that. That, so. Well, now, I, I will say it's really interesting in Essential Guide um, to get to read about your, your dad, right, who, who was real into forestry and, and um, taught at a university level and, and kind of brought you into the natural life to begin with as a kid. I mean, you talk about going out in the woods all the time and uh, even sometimes sneaking out on your own to get out there when the parents didn't want you out there. And so I think that's definitely a big uh, uh, contributor. So even if you weren't you know, even if Bigfoot had never crossed your path, so to speak, I think you'd still be out in the woods tracking yeah, something. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, love the outdoors, no doubt. How have you survived in these last two months? Have you been cooped up like the rest of us? Well, um, fortunately, the parks have stayed open. Uh, I live on the northwest side of San Antonio, mm -hmm. and there's some nice wooded parks, <laughs> trail systems, and they've stayed open. So every morning I get up and I hike two or three miles through the woods. That's my routine every day, Ooh. and that hasn't changed. So really? really and, you know, a couple of days, you know, sometimes you, you go out there and you sit down by the pond or the lake for a minute, you know, watch some birds and turtles. And, you know, it's all very calming. And so I know a lot of people don't have that opportunity if you're in an urban area. Or oh, no. Area. I, I'm surprised people can't hear my neighbors playing their stereo right next door as I'm trying to do this. <laughs> but I've been very lucky being able to, to at least get out every day in, in the woods a little bit. So. Bliss. So the other question I have for you is, as, a, as another uh, member of the Black Hat Society here, I know every time, uh, do people not recognize you when you don't have this hat on? Um, I wouldn't say they don't recognize me, <laughs> but, and it's not common, but sometimes when I wear this hat in public, I'll get recognized by a fan at the grocery oh, store. Oh, right on, restaurant. yeah. Uh -huh. But it doesn't happen a lot, you know, real frequently, you know, but people usually, when they see the hat, they instantaneously know. That's it. Well, this is me. As a tour guide, if I have this on, it's, oh, there's James. We know him. He's been in the French Quarter for 15 years. As soon as I take it off, I'm any other tourist in town. So, apparently, this is the only way people have recognized me. I just wondered if that was a universal experience. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, have a, I have a huge wardrobe of Bigfoot and cryptozoology-related T-shirts. Yeah, same way. So, so, even if I don't have the hat on, I usually have, like, a Bigfoot group or a, you know, Mothman or something on my T-shirt. So, maybe that's a hint. Yeah, exactly, right. I've got my share of ghost hunters and Museum of the Weird in, in Austin, which we're going to talk about a little bit. Uh, since we've both seen the Minnesota Iceman up close, uh, we might as well mention him. Uh, but right out of the gate, y'all, since we've got um, about 20 people on uh, watching now, I should give you the, the normal announcements. Uh, number one, as, as we learn something new about these sort of web episodes every week, uh, I've discovered that if everybody watching right now were to just share the video, um, if you share it to your own page, it'll hit your friends list. It'll spread this signal a lot farther. Uh, so even if you don't do anything else, if all you do is just share to your page, uh, that'll help quite a bit uh, to just sort of get the word out. Uh, also, as always, uh, we're going to take your questions in the comments thread. Uh, so if you leave your questions right there, we'll try to answer them as we get to them. If you want to interrupt and jump into the conversation, uh, you can tip any amount of money uh, to at No Secrets Tours on Venmo. That all goes straight to our furloughed guides who are out of work. Uh, we just learned from the city that even though uh, Louisiana is technically entering phase one tomorrow, uh, tours are not a part of phase one. So we're all sitting at home for a little while longer yet. Um, and as always, we try to give you a little incentive to throw a buck or two into the jar. So 
any donation, any tip at all, uh, will get your name in the hat uh, to receive your own personal autographed copy of Ken Gerhardt's The Essential Guide to Bigfoot. Uh, and we're going to make this one a little unique because I have a signed copy. I know there are a few other signed copies out there. Uh, but Ken's going to sign it. And then before we send it on to you, I'm going to sign it. Uh, and that will be the only copy of that book signed by two uh, uh, cryptid hunters uh, at any level because I'm far, far less important uh, than Ken and all his contemporaries. So uh, if you want to throw your name into the hat for that, uh, I really do. It's one of my favorite books if you're just getting started uh, looking into the subject. It's, it's really the best jumping off place. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, let's dive right in. So there are definitely uh, Bigfoot questions uh, that I, I want answered. And some of them we talked about kind of in the pre-interview uh, are some of the biggest uh, controversies among cryptid hunters out there. So uh, the first one is uh, there are some people who think Bigfoot is uh, very much a physical creature. Uh, he, he, you know, perhaps is a uh, unknown species of ape or maybe the missing link like Australopithecus, uh, you know, some sort of link between ape and man on the evolutionary chain. Uh, but then, of course, we've got lots of Bigfoot stories that talk about UFOs and disappearing when being shot at and holding glowing orbs as you trot across the field. Uh, and so we have what we call the woo contingent uh, that sort of thinks maybe Bigfoot is extra dimensional or he might be an alien. Um, so so it, for the purposes of this interview, uh, Mr. Gerhardt, Bigfoot, interdimensional or physical dude? Well, I'm 100% in the flesh and blood, physical, undiscovered animal um, or relic hominin, if you will, mm -hmm. man-like form. Uh, I've spent my life uh, looking at the evidence, searching all over North America, working with most of the top researchers, absorbing every book, article, uh, interviewing dozens, even hundreds of credible eyewitnesses. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying that I'm the all-knowing expert, but I'm just based on that lifetime of research, I'm convinced that they are simply undiscovered. Uh, you know, primitive humans, if you mm -hmm. want to put it that way. I know different people have different perspectives on this. Right. Um, but, you know, they, they are somewhere in the grade eight family tree, and uh, virtually all the evidence points in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, the evidence that you mentioned that discusses these weird cases of Bigfoot vanishing or being shot a hundred times, <laughs> right. phased, or red glowing eyes, all these things, um, you know, I'm not going to discredit those accounts specifically because I have colleagues that I respect that have investigated those cases. Absolutely, and they've been yeah. More exposed to it than I have, mm -hmm. but in the big, in the scheme of things, in the big picture of Bigfoot Sasquatch world, the, those types of incidents are just mini, you know they're a minuscule part of the overall uh, data set, yeah. which includes thousands of eyewitness sites sightings and most of those are very natural most often it's bigfoot walks in front of a car at night on a lonely road just steps across the road and right leans out from behind the tree time. and right mm -hmm. yeah. Or yeah people are in the woods and they see one you know picking out from behind a tree or drinking water or foraging for something walking so it's always a very natural encounter that you would expect to have with any animal in the, in the woods mm -hmm. so that's Plus, you have a lot of physical trace evidence, like footprints and things like that. So, right. um, so yeah, but, you know, I, I always qualify that by saying I'm a very open-minded person. I also have interest in the paranormal and UFOs. It's not my area of expertise. But, um, you know, so I'll acknowledge that, you know, maybe there is some other type of phenomenon that looks like Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. Somehow, however you want to present that it, it manifests in a bigfoot like form or it takes a certain appearance or you know so you know we, we certainly there's a lot of, there are a lot of mechanisms in our world in our universe that we just don't comprehend and that the, the woo bigfoot might be a, a, an aspect of that absolutely well after rereading essential guide this week it it, it struck me as um i didn't realize from my perspective. So I come at, at Bigfoot almost entirely uh, in reverse. So I started out as a paranormal guy, as a ghost hunter. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, I was really into the creepy dead stuff. Uh, but I think when we talk about any sort of phenomena like this, um, the more you study it, the more you realize that sooner or later we're all kind of rubbing elbows with one another. 
uh, because obviously Bigfoot links to some of these UFO accounts. Um, and, and I want to get your opinion uh, here in just a minute. Uh, one of my other hobbies in 2020 is I'm trying to read through um, the entire catalog of David Politis's Missing 411 books. Uh, and even that has mentioned Bigfoot a few times as a possible perpetrator for all these disappearances. Um, but the impression that I got sort of from outside the, the cryptozoological community is that those woo events, those sort of just really extraordinary, full of high strangeness Bigfoot sightings, um, I mean, understandably, they get a lot more media attention than these ones we're talking about where the guy just crosses the road or leans out from the tree. Uh, and so I think to the lay person, uh, it gives them a, a impression that that happens more often than it really does. Um, and so people like weird stuff. Exactly. And the weirder the better. Mm -hmm. And, and so, uh, you know, for example, I just did a YouTube video about something called Sheep Squatch, <laughs> which is not something I really investigated, but it's been on different TV shows. And everyone asks me about Sheep Squatch because it's like such a weird, you know, uh, exercise and mm -hmm. visualization. What is a Sheep Squatch? That's weird, you know. So you're right. People love that really right. weird, crazy stuff well y'all had a what a goat man at one point in texas and <laughs> so every once in a while we get these weird anthropomorphic uh, uh sort of beings roaming around uh, but in in your entire so you know if we see high strangeness bigfoot encounters as happening you know even as much as 30 percent of the time that's that's clearly an over exaggeration of that uh when you look at it you know gathering information gathering eyewitness accounts how often do you think it would veer into high strangeness? Is it one out of every hundred? Is it? Yeah, maybe one percent at yeah. that. Yeah. But you know, you hit on a key point earlier, James. Mm -hmm. It's very important to to keep in mind that perspective and perception is a big part of all of this Absolutely. stuff. Now, virtually everyone that asks me whether Bigfoot is somehow a spirit or interdimensional or a UFO uh, creature. Uh, Firstly, all of those people are people that start out in the paranormal. <laughs> exactly, so, right. So they're already, that's their comfort, that's your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. We all have certain biases, and that's not a bad thing. It's just as we become older, we have different influences mm -hmm. and stimuli that kind of mold who we are and our opinions. And people in the paranormal world, when they hear about Bigfoot, it's like, okay, well, you know, maybe this is related to what I do, and maybe I need to understand if they're, you know, because they're both kind of unexplained. And, right. You know, so um, so I get that, you know, but um, you know, I'm I'm kind of the other side of the sh you know uh, the shoe. I'm the you know traditional, as you said, my dad's a forestry professor. I, I enjoy zoology and traditional science, and from that perspective, Bigfoot makes sense to me as you know an undiscovered animal. Absolutely. Well, some of the evidence you present in in the books, I mean, the, the logic is is so sound. Um, you know, I love the idea that. Eventually, we got to the point where forensically we're looking for dermal ridges and, um, you know, sort of leftover. Uh, for those who don't know what dermal ridges are, those are, um, can you do it with your hand? I mean, it's kind of this right here. Yeah, just on your foot. All right. Yeah, all these lines. And so the idea is that if this goes down to the mud, yeah, we should be able to see something. Wait, say that again? All of your fans up there who are into palm reading will probably. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. You can tell our future. All right. Uh, but people that did, you know, these these fakes when they when they strap, you know, big foot shaped wooden planks onto their shoes and go to hoax these, uh, they weren't thinking at that level. They weren't thinking forensically. Uh, the one that really blows my mind is always um, sort of what what they call cripple foot, right? Where they find the the tracks and the one foot is sort of twisted, deformed. It looks like it might be curled up underneath a little bit. Uh, and, and when they showed those tracks to folks that, that really knew anatomy, you know, that were scientific experts, uh, it gave those particular prints so much credence because there was really no way for a hoaxer to really understand the way that anatomy would, would shape up. And so they said either this, this hoaxer just also happens to be an expert in anatomical configuration or these are legit tracks. Uh, and the other thing about it, those tracks went on forever. As I recall, that was one where, like, the cripple foot tracks, it's not one or two. You see a whole stretch of them going on for some distance. And I always think sometimes I don't credit hoaxers with enough patience. You know, if I, if I count a thousand tracks, I think maybe a hoaxer gives up and goes home before that. Yeah, supposedly there were over a thousand tracks found. 
mm-hmm. with a cripple, cripple foot back in Bosburg, Washington, December 69. You're right. That would take amazing dedication for someone to go out there, think about that, and leave a thousand footprints in the ground. And, right. You know, not get, not get caught in the process because that would take a while too. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I tend to agree with you. It's funny. As a, as a paranormal guy, I mean, I love all things weird and, and strange and, and spiritual. Uh, but I feel like there, there is. There's a lot more evidence when you look at the case studies to support this idea that, that it really is a flesh and blood creature. Or at least what we'll say, you know, the, the traditional Sasquatch. You know, the Bigfoot that we think of kind of coming out of the Pacific Northwest. Big, tall, furry, sloped head, uh, you know, long hanging arms, that, that guy. We've got, of course, reports. You've got a whole chapter on Littlefoot, which primarily South America or into the Southwest. We've got accounts there. Um, and then, of course, there's Yetis and, you know, Hopkinsville goblins in Kentucky and, and who knows what else. Oh, what do you got there? This is a Littlefoot track, supposedly. Oh. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is from the Orang Pendek, which is uh, from Sumatra. Uh-huh. It's been featured on different TV shows like Finding Bigfoot. Um, this was cast by my colleague Adam Davis, who's an outstanding field researcher who's been to Sumatra many times. Wow. And it's uh, it's different than a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch. It's smaller, but it's also not very – it's more ape-like than human-like, right? Because it has the highly divergent – Yeah, I was about to say, yeah, you see that thumb is here. way – right. And the toes are shorter, so mm-hmm. it's not a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch or a miniature, but – You know, Adam thinks and other researchers think that it might be some type of upright ape, undiscovered upright ape related related to orangutan bipedals. So well and that so I I, um I went to high school and and college in Indiana and had a good, good friend who was a a ranger out there. Uh, and Indiana's got some Bigfoot sightings. It's got more national parks, I think, than people give it credit for. Uh, but that's that's the fact that's always struck with me. So this ranger told me, and I never did pull out a map of the United States to really verify this. Um, but he said, we have so much uh, sort of untouched land and natural parks in our country that it is technically possible to walk from Mexico to Canada without ever leaving real wilderness parkland without really crossing civilization. You may have to cross some roads, which is often, you know, where we see those sightings, uh, but you can avoid human settlement much easier than I think most of us really conceptualize when we think of the United States. So to me, that's always, I, I always imagine that somewhere there's a map and we've got sort of the Sasquatch migratory patterns on it, where if you knew where those sort of trails were and could position yourself along those routes, you'd have such a better shot of, of seeing it. Uh, but of course, beyond that's beyond my level of expertise. But uh, the other thing that really kind of made me a believer in this notion of physical Bigfoot uh, is this one of the one of the examples the, the high strangeness folks give over and over and over again is Bigfoot's apparent ability to just disappear. And I don't mean camouflage or hide himself in the woods. They say I was looking at him and then he vanished. Uh, and, and that always struck me as, well, you can't an animal can't just vanish. Uh, and then, not too long ago, uh, on YouTube, I started watching um, uh, one of my little hobbies. I watch airsoft videos. And they had an airsoft sniper that brought a full ghillie suit with it. And, and then you sit and watch as other players, literally, they're, they're sitting right next to the guy and don't know he's there. And so if a guy in a ghillie suit with some training can go motionless and be so invisible next to the terrain that you can literally walk six inches from him and never realize he was there, why couldn't one of these creatures do it? And so getting to see that happen with this guy and then imagining sort of, oh, well, that's, that's got to be how it is with Bigfoot. Uh, the number of times I wonder that a hunter or a witness has crossed paths and not realized it just because of that. Um, well, I, I always tell people, you know, um, again, being an avid outdoorsman, uh, you know, I've had uh, deer run right by me and stop, you know, literally a, f- you know, a few feet away from me. And the way that they're able to camouflage themselves in brush, you know, I couldn't see them. I mean, that, that, that seemed miraculous to me. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, again, I'm not here to question anyone's subjective experiences. Right. Um, I've never interviewed a witness who's seen a Bigfoot vanish into thin air. I know I've, I've heard there are accounts like that out there. Mm-hmm. But it all it all rolls back around to perception. Uh-huh. And, you know, there are many examples I could give you of animals, James, that display amazing, remarkable abilities that it, before science came along, humans would have probably looked at it and said that, you know, that's not of this world. 
Right, it's a magic power, exactly. Do this or that, but it's just an animal's ability or skill to adapt to a very specific thing. And a lot of animals are very good at just not being seen and camouflaging themselves and, and being stealthy. So that, that could appear to or be interpreted as, on some levels, something miraculous or supernatural. But well, it's just a heightened ability to do something that really amazes us. And I want to touch on, on one of those because it ties back into kind of my background as a, as a ghost hunter. Uh, and you mentioned at one point uh, the idea that perhaps Bigfoot, if it's a species of undiscovered animal, uh, has the ability to emit uh, infrasound. Right, which uh, for without diving into the, the whole explanation, of that basically sounds that are so low frequency we as human beings can't hear them. Uh, but you just like sort of we can't hear you dog can. whistles, you hear dogs react. You can still feel it. It still has an effect yeah. on us. Mm -hmm. um, and there are certainly other animals uh, that we know of in the animal kingdom that have the ability to generate this infrasound. Yeah. Um, and what's very interesting to me is that typically those are what uh, is it below twenty hertz? Do I have that line correct? Um, yes, below yeah. 20 hertz. Anything below 20 hertz. So uh, as an old ghost hunter from way back, we, we used to talk about 19 hertz being the ghost frequency. Uh, so the idea is that if you had something just blasting out this note in 19 hertz, no human being that walks into the room is ever going to hear it. But people that walk into the room are going to start to feel nervous or a little paranoid or feel like they're being watched. Uh, and especially when we talk about Bigfoot, um, you know, there are definitely accounts that talk about that just paralyzing fear that comes with them. Now, I think if a seven and a half foot tall hominid walked out of the woods, I'm going to be paralyzed with fear or at least astonishment no matter what. Um, but they also talk about the Oz effect, which I think is so interesting. That idea that just before Bigfoot kind of steps out onto the scene, uh, everything in the forest goes quiet, right? Just all the bugs stop buzzing and the birds stop chirping. Um, and I think you posited that infrasound could explain that phenomenon as well. Yeah, I mean, if animals are sensitive to uh, frequencies, you know, those frequencies, like you said, they're more like vibration. They're so low that, well, at least for human hearing, you know, it's below our range. Um, I, I can't speak to, obviously, most animals have extended ranges of, of senses mm -hmm. that we don't have, right. many do. Um, but yeah, that's one of the things that's been reported with regard to a lot of uh, eyewitnesses I've interviewed or mm -hmm. people that think they've been close to a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch always say, well, you know, the woods just went deathly silent. Everything stopped. The yeah. insects, the birds, all the noises that you usually just kind of subconsciously mm -hmm. hear when you're out there. And um, so I don't know. That maybe that could be an explanation if other animals are able to, to pick up on those infrasound, right. infrasound waves. But it's all really just speculation, James. I mean, we just we don't have real answers to these. We just have, you know, years and years of sightings and, and tantalizing bits of evidence here and there, and we just have to try to piece those together into some working hypotheses. Right. So that brings us the other big Bigfoot controversy, which is if this is a physical creature uh, that that exists out there, we just have not found, uh, you know, definitive proof of it. Um, so I'm out in the, the woods and I stumble across Sasquatch uh, and I've got my, my 22 rifle with me. Well, the scientist in me says, if I can bring back a Bigfoot corpse to the scientists, right, uh, then that's definitive proof. Uh, but there are other people that say, no, that's like shooting a, a caveman to prove the existence of cavemen. That's a, a living, thinking being uh, and that it would be akin to murder. So uh, it, it just was fascinating to me when I went to the Texas conference. Uh, because I had no idea that this was as divisive of an issue uh, as it is within the community. Uh, so, so again, we've, we've said King Gerhardt comes down on the physical side of things. Now we'll ask you the big, big other one. Are you a kill or a no-kill Bigfoot hunter? Well, I have to respectfully correct one thing you said oh, a second about, about a twenty-two. <laughs> you don't think that would stop a Bigfoot, huh? Bigfoot with a twenty-two. <laughs> Best of luck. Mm -hmm. Meaning that I thought that the only way to conclusively prove that Bigfoot exists is to, to somebody to shoot one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as grisly as it sounds, the theory is that if one is killed, then suddenly it's proven to be real without a doubt. And right. then you can force, hopefully, the, the government or government agencies yeah. or whatever. To the NSF, them. yeah. Whoever it is funding these, 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 right. They exist. You know, you can't shoot one or harm, which incidentally, some there are some places in the U.S., 
That's right. Harm a Bigfoot. It's against the law yep. in certain counties, believe it or not. Um, but I wasn't a pro kill group. Um, this was mostly at a place called Monster Central, which is up in northwest Louisiana. Yeah, in, in Louisiana and, itself, uh, right. That, that particular group later had a TV series called Killing Bigfoot, so it was kind of a sh- controversial. That kind of stoked the fires a little bit. I was right. no longer involved with those gentlemen at that point. But um, I think I've kind of come around now to a different perspective, which is, you know, I love animals. I obviously don't want to see any animals harmed or harassed or unnecessarily shot or killed. Um, I don't think photographic evidence will ever be conclusive at this point. So my really my I think that all energy should be focused on the ultimate goal of finding one that's already dead. Oh, sure. And, uh, you know, if, if these things exist, there are thousands of them out there. Surely at some point one of them may have died of natural causes, and there's a, there are huge animals. So I mean, there's, you know, a femur, a skull, even if a tooth. So I just wish that more researchers would focus on trying to, as, as difficult as that sounds, trying to find the remains of one that's died of natural causes. So I'm currently no kill. Okay. Um, I can respect that. I mean, again, I don't, I don't think I've got the capability of killing a Bigfoot, let alone the, the intention. So well, um, I've got to... One, one interesting thing real quick. Yeah, please. When I did, when I was in the pro-kill group, okay, all the guys carried like monster... <laughs> right. It was like, so at that point, I was actually looking for and shopping for things like weather 357 Weatherbees, which are basically like water buffalo guns from Africa. Right. If, if I shoot this thing, I want it to go down because otherwise it's going to rip me in pieces. You want to find the sorry. exact right caliber between killing it in one shot and leaving enough evidence behind that you can recognize a body afterwards, right? <laughs> Oh well, yeah, I brought down a big foot with a howitzer. There's just nothing there anymore, so I've got no proof. Um, I've got a. There's a great question in our comment thread uh, that I want to bring up. So we were talking about Bigfoot routes, as I as kind of threw that out. Um, and and Adam here in New Orleans asked, do the routes correspond to caves? Uh, and and I think my joke would be, well, no. Again, you're thinking of goblins and and kobolds and lots of other cryptids that we could talk about. Um, but I want to come back to caves when it comes to evidence because. That's where I think you think we should be searching for this material evidence of, of Bigfoot, right? Yeah. Yeah, caves are excellent in terms of preserving fossils. Mm-hmm. Many of uh, many miraculous discoveries of, of, for example, the fossil hominins that have been made in recent years, the man-like forms like Homo sediba, Homo naledi, mm-hmm. Homo floresiensis, Gigantopithecus, all of those were found in caves, teeth and different bones, because caves obviously they preserve remains, bones and fossilized bones very well. The climate is very constant. It's cool. It's, you know, often dry and cool. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I think that there's a good chance that if, if someone has an opportunity to safely and legally explore a cave, that maybe they could get lucky finding out big foot remains. Right. But uh, good question from the chat room. Mm-hmm. The thing is, not every habitat has caves. Obviously, if you have, if you live in Kentucky, then, then heck yes. <laughs> yeah, so absolutely right. Caves. But in Louisiana and southeast Texas, there ain't no caves. No, no, it's none. A swamp. So, you know, in that case, you, you know, it's, it's not going to do you any good. There have actually been studies done where, you know, 1,300 Bigfoot reports were put into a computer in order to determine if there was some type of migration pattern or seasonal pattern. And nothing really nothing came up. Oh, that. wow. So at this point, it would be safe to assume that they simply follow the food. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, they, 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 their patterns. Now, on that point, the one, one quick thing, um, I have a colleague up in uh, Oregon, Cliff Berkman, who's on that show, Finding Bigfoot. Sure, he's, right. He has one particular area that he's found that they're always there in a certain month. And I knew another researcher in Oregon who had been having a lot of activity and figured out that it was not too far away from there, like maybe 60 miles mm-hmm. to the west, and tried to get her to pin down when... Bigfoot was being sighted in that area, and sure enough, it seemed like, okay, they're really active in this area, you know, 60 miles away this month, and then this time of year, they become more prevalent here and less prevalent here, so you could make that assumption that, you know, 60 miles isn't that far for a migration, that an animal, right, right. but it was going from higher elevation in the summer to a lower elevation in the cooler months, which Mm -hmm. again makes sense, because, you know, in the cooler months, the mountains, the higher elevation are less productive in terms of food and, and things like that. So it's all it's all 
it's speculation, but you know, it's interesting to think Absolutely. about. Absolutely. But I love that your speculation is, is grounded in science. That's what I really love about it. You consider if this is any kind of animal, how do animals act? And so again, I don't want to tip uh, kind of everything you bring up in the essential guide, but uh, to answer Adam's question, we, we have not dug into the, the habits of how predators versus prey animals die. Uh, we haven't talked about whether or not Bigfoot has any sort of burial or funereal practices, uh, which could muddy the waters even more. Uh, so there's, there's lots to talk when you, when you think about just coming up with some sort of physical sample of bone or, or scat or a piece of fur. Um, <laughs> we got another question uh, from my wife, of all people, who I guess wants to know which areas have Bigfoot legislature. Uh, I think that's where we're going to go Bigfoot hunting now. <laughs> yeah. First up was a place called Skamania County in Washington State. Yeah, I thought it was Washington which State. Is, which is kind of in an area where there have been a lot of traditional Bigfoot sightings. And um, it's kind of uh, south of Seattle, kind of between Yakima and Seattle, sort of, race, uh, close to the coast. Mm-hmm. Skamania County, Washington, has an ordinance passed in 1969 that you cannot harm, molest, or otherwise kill or impede a Sasquatch. Also, I've heard that uh, Bellingham, Washington, which is up in the uh, Olympic Peninsula of Washington, Mm -hmm. and that's a Native American reservation mostly, and they've had hundreds of sightings up there, and there's supposedly a a law up there. And also uh, the town of Whitehall, New York, which is in upstate New York, where uh, Bigfoot, very famous incident, Bigfoot was allegedly encountered by some off-duty police officers uh, up there in the 1970s, and uh, it, it, it was a pretty big story, and I guess that had an impact on the local, uh, and you know, a lot of times these are kind of fun, I guess, you can't rule out that maybe some of these communities are kind of doing this like tongue-in-cheek. It's right, like Roswell does them. with aliens. Yeah, it's yeah. Kind of, you know, it's like, okay, we got our local edge and it's Bigfoot and we're going to protect it. Champ, the lake monster, right, of course. and some of these other have protections too, you know, so it's, but you know, but it's true. You, you better not take a $10,000 fine and five years in jail if you... So don't shoot Bigfoot there is what you're saying. (laughs) You're saying don't shoot Bigfoot anywhere, but especially not there. Uh, All right. So I want to hit a couple more uh, topics while I've got you. Uh, One, I I kind of brought all of my. Here, it's funny. We both have prints within uh, arm's reach. You recognize that one? Yeah, that's Patty. That's Patty. That's right. So that's the Patterson Bigfoot mold. Um, that's of course the Patterson Gimlin I suppose we should really call it Uh, and I just dropped if you don't know what we're talking about when we say the Patterson footage Bigfoot uh, I dropped a gif in our comment thread of the famous video Uh, as soon as I say a video of Bigfoot the one that pops into your head is Patty that's that's what we're talking about Uh, and here's another interesting thing where I guess it pays to be on the inside of the community as opposed to the outside Uh, because I think like a lot of other people I had heard until 2017 that the Patterson Gimlin film had been debunked, uh, that it, someone had come out and said they'd hoaxed it, they admitted to it, they had a costume they could show people. Uh, and then after meeting all of you and, and especially getting to come into that conference on the 50th anniversary of the film, uh, to hear all of the evidence to the contrary is just astonishing. Um, so not to put words in your mouth, but, but your assertion is that it was not at all faked. Uh, you know, this is, don't, I hope no one out there takes this as an anti-media or, you know, this is in no way decided, intended to be political, but mm-hmm. the media, in terms of some of these mysteries like Bigfoot and UFO cases and things, the media really likes uh, these stories about hoaxes being debunked because it, it provides the reader with a sense of resolution. There's right. a psychology going on. Right. People love, people love it when things are resolved. Oh, okay, now we know that that was fake. So whenever anyone comes out and claims that they fake something that's, that people know about, whether it's related to Bigfoot or paranormal ghost hunting, you know, whatever, you know, a lot of times people will, okay, accept that. But, um, you know, anyone can make a claim that they fake something. That's just, that's another form of hoaxing, basically. Right, right, hoaxing the you hoax, know, exactly. A hoaxing a hoax. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, that was the guy. That was me. And that was you that said that, yeah. <laughs> Just 
recently saw, and I wish I had it to present. Sorry? Oh, I said I, I just saw something that I'd never seen before, and I wish I had it just to kind of present it in video form. But um, I saw a video of someone of, of something that was purported to be the same footage, but from like the back, so that we have it's almost like 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 the JFK thing. We've got two different camera angles, uh, one that's what we see, and then the other that is from somebody else that was hidden. And and the fact that in 20 years of doing this, I had never seen it before this year. You know, it was enough to kind of send all the red flags up for me anyway. But, yeah, allegedly there is now a second Patterson video going around that I figured and was bunk. he moved. He changed positions a few times. Uh-huh. So the first, when he was first, I saw this thing, he got thrown off his horse and he had a movie camera. He was shaking around, and right. And he's stumbling and tripping over rocks and logs and things because he's looking straight ahead and he's going down a riverbank. Right. And so he finally stopped and perched himself, steadied himself on a log, and that's when the famous shot of the Bigfoot, you can see it steady. Yeah, and it kind of looks over his shoulder at the guy, right. He got up and, he got up again and moved behind it, mm -hmm. even though it was farther away. So then he got an angle of it walking directly into the woods. So a lot of people haven't seen the whole segment, but if you look at the whole thing, then, then yeah, he does change position a couple of times. So that, but, you know, there might be people trying to fake a version of the, of the film. That wouldn't surprise me. Right. Um, so, so that's that's one I want. I love the idea that that's still around because it is such a compelling piece of footage. Uh, and, and to your point, say say again. The footprints. It's not just the footprints. Yeah, I mean, yeah, leave behind physical evidence that looks like this. And this is yeah. my head for scale, everyone. This is huge. Ten of them, those were cast. Yeah. And they all they all look, they all look slightly different because when something walks, it, every footprint looks a little bit different. Right. Not all cookie cutter. Things, you know, mm -hmm. impressions. Yeah. Um, what was the other thing I was going to ask you about that? Rats. Um, oh, it just went right out of my head. Um, well, oh no, it's the, about the video itself. Uh, you know that I sort of feel the same way you do about photographic evidence. Um, so, so I know ghost hunters hear this, and, and certainly I think it's it's not unique to us. Um, as cell phones get cameras. You know, the, the skeptic's favorite line is, well, now everybody is carrying a camera, so why don't we have more pictures of ghosts? Why don't we have more photographic evidence of Bigfoot? Why don't we see more UFOs? And the statistical answer is, actually, we do. It's just that a lot of that footage is immediately dismissed as Photoshop or, or edited or a hoax. Uh, so it's hard. It's, it's, it's one of those where I don't know what video of Bigfoot could pass the sniff test for a skeptic in the age of CGI and, and digital manipulation and things like that. Um, so it's back to your point where we almost need that, that physical evidence, that hard evidence uh, that we can point at. Um, otherwise, it's that old yeah, thing, you know. So in, more so in cryptozoology, I don't, as I said, I have many friends in the paranormal field, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I, many of them are actively trying to collect evidence but I don't really get the sense that the point of the paranormal field or the ghost hunter field is we're going to convince the scientific establishment that ghosts are real and that the spirit world exists. I think that they all kind of understand that even with the very best evidence, science is not quite ready to take that right. leap yet. You know, that's kind of more, it's, it's, beyond, it's almost beyond the, the veil of science. But something like Bigfoot, I think, is accessible in terms of, as we discussed, it's a living creature, it leaves bones behind when it dies, it has DNA, right. you know, we could prove this thing real, and most cryptozoologists, traditional cryptozoologists like myself, that look for Bigfoot and uh, the Loch Ness Monster and things like that, that's what we want to do, we want to convince the scientific establishment mm -hmm. that these are real animals that have not been discovered yet, so it's, just, it's a slightly different dynamic. Speaking only for myself, on behalf of the whole ghost hunter community, I'm not looking to, to convince all of science that ghosts are real. Uh, again, just enough of them that I can get funding. Uh, and then we'll continue to do more research on their dime. Uh, I think that's the goal of all of us, right? Just somebody else pay for my investigations and my travel, and then I'll, I'll chase things uh, for the rest of my life. Uh, so, so I promised everybody, uh, before we, we get to any more questions, uh, I said when we were advertising this episode, we would talk about what is uh, most likely to abduct me in the bayous of Louisiana. 
Uh, now, what's funny about that is, is you know, I, I lived on uh, literally right off of Bourbon Street for 10 years of my life in the heart of New Orleans in the French Quarter. Uh, so really, the only cryptids I saw were the ones leaving the bars at 3 a.m. every night. Uh, yeah, not quite the same. Uh, so I, you know, I don't venture out into the bayous and the swamp uh, as much as, as perhaps I could, um, which is a real shame because 40 miles north of us here in New Orleans, we have a huge uh, uh, sort of area of interest, which is Honey Island. Um, so you've had experience and, and in fact, um, were there, what, last year, 2019, doing some investigation? Just over a year ago. Yeah, so um, for, the, for, for the people that are watching that don't know about this place at all, can you give them a quick rundown of, of kind of Honey Island and its swamp monster? Yeah, the Honey Island Swamp is part of the Pearl River Basin, mm -hmm. which, as you said, is kind of just north of the week, about 40 miles north of yeah. uh, New Orleans. Just there. a little bit above the big lake that everybody knows, near, right? Near Slidell, mm -hmm. and uh, it's also adjacent, goes into Mississippi a little mm -hmm. bit. But it's a pretty wild, it's like the American version of the, of the Congo jungle or, or the Amazon jungle. It's just a giant swamp. It's, you know, uh, very submerged, um, you know, lots of gators and things like that, as you would expect. Right. But there's this, this story, <clears throat> I should say story, but there have been sightings of a creature known as the Honey Island Swamp Monster. And the sightings go back to the 1960s, 1964-65 uh, was the first documented sighting. And then um, seen by a guy named Harlan Ford, who was hunting out there with his buddy, and uh, they also began to find these footprints and also dead hogs that they think had been killed by this thing. And um, it was featured on the, a 1970s TV show called In Search of with Leonard right. Nimoy. There was right. actually a Honey Island Swamp Monster episode, which is right. kind of good. <clears throat> so, yeah, it's, it's basically, in my opinion, it's a, it's a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch that just lives out in that habitat. Mm -hmm. Now, there were some fake footprints that were found that looked kind of like a half man, half gator type thing. And those actually ended up at uh, some university there in New Orleans. I forget where. But um, is it Xavier? Yeah, that yeah, this is Xavier University, okay. sure. Yeah, I think they ended up with a professor at Xavier that was like, oh, these are weird. They don't look like any. Anyways, um, a colleague of mine met some people. He was investigating that area years ago, and he met a family that had a pair of shoes in the attic and on these shoes, on the bottom of these shoes were attached the exact shaped fake feet that had been used to make all these footprints. Well, there you go. There's physical evidence for you. They look like half alligator, half man. And by the way, you guys have a legend of a creature up there known, known as Latiche. And Latiche is like a half man, half gator kind of swamp dwelling, uh, swamp dwelling creature. Kind of like the, the Rougarou, but kind right. of like a, a gator instead of a wolf. But, um, but anyways... I'm convinced the Honey Island Swamp Monster does exist. Last year I was on an episode of a TV show called America Unearthed, and that's where we went down and investigated that case. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a uh, controversial video, and there have been a lot of sightings, and I, I've, I've interviewed some people that have, that have had experiences out there. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of like your local version of Bigfoot, but it's pretty famous up there. Yeah, so, well, for yeah, the longest yeah, time, the and Bigfoot community. I don't know if it's still yeah. there, but when I was a kid and would go to the zoo, in the Louisiana Swamp Exhibit, they had a Honey Island Swamp Monster just as a as a stunt. But that's the yeah. Audubon Society, you know. So if even the Audubon Society is is kind of in on the stories, you know, they they got around at the very least. Uh, so I know that's the most famous one. And then of course we've got kind of oh northwestern Louisiana as we get up to Caddo Parish, and you know we get close to that part of Arkansas, which I know is kind of one of your big stomping grounds is uh, kind of the 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 Fook. Monster, and that's F O U K E for anybody that's not familiar with the the spelling of that. Um, and so, and that's near where um, Monster Central is, right? That that's sort of the same area, or are they a little just just, just north of Monster Central, right? A little bit. Mm -hmm. Boggy Creek runs all the way down. If anyone's ever heard of the legend of Boggy Creek, that's uh, <clears throat> same thing as the Fog Monster. Mm -hmm. By the way, there is going to be a Fog Monster Festival. It's still scheduled for August first uh, up there in Fog, Arkansas. So if anyone's interested in a Bigfoot, it's not you know not too big. It might be a couple hundred people there, and I'm sure they're going to take measures to make sure everyone feels comfortable. But um, well, I can say if it was anything like the, some the... Of the cast members from the movie The Legend of Bob oh, cool. will be there and stuff. So. Well, I will say, if it's, if it's anything like that East Texas Bigfoot Conference, um, I think one of the greatest things about those conferences was the fact that all of you were available to, to sit and chat and talk to. You know, it wasn't one of those where 
you watch the panel for 45 minutes and then those guys are never seen again. Um, you, you know, you guys were accessible and, and willing to kind of entertain anything. Um, there was even a point towards the end where we were just letting people come up and talk about their own personal experiences. Uh, and of course that can get a little, a little into the woo or sometimes a little cringy, but, but there's no, there was no judgment. There was no anything else. Uh, so, so again, and that's sometimes hard to find in this sphere, you know, like we all come in with our own biases. Uh, I love the fact that, uh, through all your research, uh, something you should get credit for, um, is, is how, how out of your way you go to be respectful, not only of the native American tribes that are still in some of these regions, especially out kind of in the West, uh, but even how respectful you are of their beliefs of their old uh, because you trace back these these ideas of Bigfoot being a uh, perhaps kind of a lost tribe or you know a lot of the Native Americans talk about it as if they are people not for lack of a better word monsters uh, and so to see um, you know a, a person like us going into that culture and being that respectful again that's a rarity I find uh, certainly I know other investigators that are as respectful but I know a lot of Bigfoot hunters that would just either ignore it or trump right through native land if that's the way the trail went and and you're neither though so so credit where it's due uh that's really I appreciate it. Part, part of that is when i was growing up mm -hmm. my mother was a travel agent and she took me on a lot of amazing vacations all over the world and one of the first vacations we ever went on was we camped along the amazon river um and we got i got to meet primitive tribes like the Hivaro and the yagua i mean wow. these are people living in a stone age level with skirts and blow mm -hmm. guns and you know it taught me at a young age to respect you know that there are people all over the world that live in different you know cultures and just because you come from one culture you certainly don't know anything about someone else's culture and particularly what you know their experiences and what they're used to and that often entails the animals that they've lived alongside for thousands of years and you know if, if, if they have a tradition of a specific thing you know even if it doesn't make sense to you, it's it's disrespectful to just kind of poo-poo it and, and disregard it. I mean, you should respect the fact that they have this important tradition and it, it symbolizes something. Right. And well, and there is, you know, as a, as a collector of stories, as a historian, there is so much information and wisdom that's there. It's just sometimes you have to kind of reinterpret it to get to the bottom of it. So, you know, one of my favorite stories is up near Crater Lake, uh, you know, if you, if you listen to the stories of the native people in Crater Lake, they were there for whatever event it was that caused that lake in the first place, that it's in their mythology, like our Noah and the Ark and, and everything else. Um, yeah. And so it's, it's one of those where you think, oh, that's just an old myth, but no, it's got legitimate, it, it explains exactly the phenomena that happened right there. And I do think yeah. that there's some, there's some parallels when we talk about cryptids and and thunderbirds and you know other things like that um i know i'm using a, a key word for you there uh you, that you've done a lot of thunderbird research as well um i it's funny we're talking about this there's another question in the comment um that asks are there any similarities between wendigo and bigfoot sightings uh, do you have any familiarity with the the wendigos at all are the ones that I'm used to, right? say a wendigo in some myths is a spirit that arises from someone that had to resort to cannibalism to survive and then died you know it's very much kind of this curse idea right so in that respect it doesn't really match in my opinion doesn't match the big foot of the sasquatch which is completely hair cover he's gigantic mm -hmm. and man like but he's covered in hair and not skinny at all they're usually pretty big and robust right so i don't know but there might be a connection on, on some levels mm -hmm. 
Well, there's definitely there's more high strangeness associated with Wendigo encounters, I think, than we see yeah, with Bigfoot I, encounters. That's more of a paranormal thing, I think, mm-hmm. and uh, still fascinating, but I don't investigate that because I view that more as a supernatural or paranormal type thing. Do you want to touch on Thunderbirds at all, real briefly? Um, Thunderbirds, um, you know, I've interviewed hundreds of people. I'm sorry, dozens of people. I was thinking of Bigfoot there for a second. I've interviewed dozens, not quite as many eyewitnesses, right. but I've interviewed where they've seen these monstrous birds with wingspans ranging from 12 to 15, 20 feet across, mm-hmm. you know, much larger than a condor or anything else right. known. And, um, you know, the, the sightings range pretty much all over North America, but there are certain hot spots, Texas, mm-hmm. Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Alaska are two f- four hot spots. Mm-hmm. There are Native American traditions, again, Native American traditions that are very widespread of thunderbirds. That's what they're called. Um, and so, you know, there, I think it's possible that these animals, again, may be undiscovered prehistoric relics, and uh, the Native Americans were familiar with them and revered them, and so they paid homage to them in their traditions and on their totem poles and mm-hmm. things. And right. It's interesting that we have modern sightings of people that swear they've seen these birds, and um, but, you know, there's no, unlike Bigfoot, there's really no physical evidence even physical trace evidence, there's no good film. Yeah, you would think we would we would come up with a handful of feathers or, or something yeah, if it's a physical bird, right? Point, a giant feather or eggshell mm-hmm. or nest or bird crap or something mm-hmm. enormous would, would turn up, and we just haven't found anything like that yet. But the, the people I've interviewed are extremely credible, and oftentimes they're people that are very familiar with the outdoors, hunters, ranchers, you know, people that are used to seeing birds on a daily basis. Right. Who can accurately measure or, or estimate the wingspan, etc. Uh. Yeah, so, but you know, I, in most of my books, apart from the Bigfoot book, I write about Thunderbirds in most of my other books. Right. So. Uh, and so, so check those out. So there's one called Big Bird, which I know I'm waiting on. That's the one that's, that's going to complete my Ken Gerhardt library. Uh, but also your encounters with winged humanoids. I think certainly anybody that's interested in Wendigo, Thunderbirds, anything else like that uh, should pick that one up. Uh, and I personally would be remiss as a, as a sort of follower of John Keel if we didn't bring up Mothman, at least in passing. Um, so, so I'll do it obliquely. There's a, there's a question I wanted to ask you. Um, again, especially reading Essential Guide and going back to this, do you think it's, I mean, certainly it's possible, but do you suspect we may be looking at several different species as opposed to one that ranges all over North America? Uh, so I know, for instance, the skunk apes in Florida, right? We have some Bigfoots that smell terrible and, what, 85 to 90 percent of them that don't have any report of a smell at all. Um, and so, and, and of course, you have theories about that in the book, uh, which will kind of let people discover on their own. But do you think that's a, a perhaps a different species, a different subspecies, something that, that's a genetic variant that has that ability and the other squatches kind of up in the Pacific Northwest don't? flying humanoids mm-hmm. the, the physical descriptions are all over the map mm-hmm. so um, and in the course of researching and writing that book I came to the conclusion that if these things exist they are squarely supernatural metaphysical or paranormal in nature which means it'd be hard to flash flash and blood. Mm-hmm. there's no consistency as far as their physical description the behavior pattern mm-hmm. but more importantly they just don't make sense from a zoological point of view <laughs> right. there's nothing in the fossil record that would indicate I think I'd be more inclined to believe alien before I believe genetic experiment. But uh. well, the thing about the flying humanoids is there's all kinds of residual weirdness if you delve into that phenomenon. It's more than just the sightings of the creature. There's poltergeist activity and UFOs okay. and curses. Men in black, all sorts of right. Yeah, I mean it, it really uh, the rabbit hole gets real deep real quick. Attach what you guys refer to as attachments where people mm-hmm. have the sighting and then all this other stuff happens mm-hmm. to the men in black. sort of how I feel. So we've got the myths down here of the Loop Garu, you know, or the Rugaru, you know, the, these, these werewolf-like entities. 
Uh, and certainly, you know, you, you and I, we could, we could go on another hour about uh, Linda Moulton Howe and the dog men that are up in the Midwest and, and kind of, you know, skinwalkers out in Utah and, and all the rest. Uh, but there seems to be this, this other sort of cryptid animal that is part man, part dog, that is distinguishable from Bigfoot, who's kind of part man, part ape. Uh, but one of the things we hear about the dog man and the Rugaru are this notion of the, the eye glare. Right, this reflective, you know, either they have bright red eyes, or in the case of the Rugaru, they're supposed to be bright yellow eyes that you can see kind of staring at you out in the distance. Um, and and again, uh, coming from a zoological background, uh, you you kind of educated me in that there are species. I mean, obviously, we know cats' eyes glow in the dark. You know, they have that kind of reflective membrane. But but that's what I learned that it's a membrane in the eye that causes that phenomenon and that most primates have evolved out of it. So we may have had it at one time, but, but no living primate that we know of has it any longer. Uh, and so it's, so, some uh, not, uh, habitually nocturnal primates like Galagos and um, Lorises, which are you know very primitive, but you're mm -hmm. right, most primates do not have the tapetum and loose them because we're diurnal. Most primates right. are, are you know, adapted be active during the day, not at night. So. In your opinion, if, if a, let's say a Bigfoot, for the sake of argument, is a nocturnal primate slash hominid of some kind, um, in that case, is it possible they, they just never lost that evolutionary advantage? They kept it because they're nocturnal, or? Or they developed it as they Oh, sure, man, evolutionary strategy, absolutely. It's possible, sure. Mm -hmm. Because that's something I, I always found very interesting was that You've got this host of supernatural creatures like Mothman, like Dogmen, um, who are all reported as having these glowing red eyes. And then you come to Bigfoot and he's, he's changed by ass sometimes, yes. Most of the time, no. Uh, so, so what's the example there? And so I, I have this idea that maybe we've got two or three different versions of this same kind of cryptid uh, that we could search for. Uh-oh, it looks like you might be frozen. Are you there? Can you see me? I can see you. You're 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 back with us. Okay, sorry, my phone. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. There. No, no worries. That's a hell of a fish above your head, Ken. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> no, no That's worries. One of the first monsters I ever caught. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, with, with that in mind, let me. Um, I'm sorry, I've not been scrolling through my comments here, but guys, if you're around. Uh, as always, again, you can get entered to win a signed copy of one of Ken's books. Uh, so any donation in our tip jar goes to that. Uh, also, you can drop messages straight into the comments. And let me scroll down. You would think I'd be better at this technology after six weeks of doing this, and yet. Um, so what's, what's next for you? I mean, that's always something we like to ask people. Um, Essential Guide just came out, I think, within the last year. And like I said, I, I feel like especially if you're coming into this phenomena cold, if you don't have some of the background, if, if Ken and I are dropping names that, that you don't recognize, please, please, please pick up this book uh, and it'll sort of bring you up to speed. Um, also, thank you as one uh, investigator to another. I appreciate anybody who puts their bibliography in the back of the book uh, because so often we get these books where people have clearly done just extensive and wonderful research and then don't give you any hint as to what it was. Uh, so here, if we want to kind of chase you, follow in your footsteps, uh, there's also, again, and, and we'll leave it to the readers of the book, there's a, a great appendix about DNA studies uh, of, of different Bigfoot evidence, all the different hair samples that have come in and things like that. Um, and again, that was maybe one of my favorite parts of, of the conference I went to, is that you had a, a, a literal forensics expert there to talk about how to properly pick up evidence without contaminating it from a forensic point of view. It's very much a practical, hands-on kind of education uh, because they're so often, uh, one of the funniest ones is they talk about, you know, you get a, a print this big and of course your first notion is to want to take the picture and put your hand in it to show everybody how big it really is. And then as soon as you do that, you've messed up this dermal ridge area right there. So they're like, please don't touch the footprints, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I thought that was great. So that DNA is, uh, it's eye-opening. It's interesting to see the, the science behind it. Uh, but but post-essential guide to Bigfoot, you know, once quarantine is lifted, we're all allowed to move about the country uh, as we like. 
Uh, where are you headed next? Well, um, hopefully we get back to a level of normalcy um, at some point. And uh, if so, I have several uh, public appearances uh, that are planned for later this year at different events. I mentioned the Falk Monster Festival in Falk, Arkansas on August 1st. I'll be in Gatlinburg, Tennessee at the Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Conference uh, on July 25th. Okay. Um, I'm going to be speaking at the Texas Bigfoot Conference in, uh, not the East Texas, but the North the Texas. Big Texas, Texas, right, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully Mothman Festival in West Virginia. We don't have a confirmation of that yet. Right. Uh, the Van Meter Festival, Van Meter Visitor Festival in Iowa. That's kind of like a Mothman type creature. Mm -hmm. And I'll also be at the uh, Upper Peninsula Bigfoot event in Michigan. So oh, wow. what this you? year I'm looking forward to getting out and doing some lectures again. And uh, I'm also working on a new book, but I'm just not not in a position to disclose what that's about yet. I hear so, you. Uh, that's, we'll keep that's it under wraps for now. Um, but yeah, absolutely, guys. Go to Ken's Facebook page. We linked it in our comments. Uh, please, please, please pick it up. Uh oh, <laughs> one of my good friends. Uh, Says, not a question, just a fun fact. A workers' compensation claimant in one of our cases had their benefits cut off after they appeared on a Bigfoot hunting show here in Louisiana. Oh, wow. Well, wow, okay. Uh, yeah, so apparently, uh, if you have any workmen's compensation claims, do not publicly hunt Bigfoot. Keep that private <laughs> away from the lawyers and the insurance agents. How odd. Of course, you know, any of us, we're used to our... Uh, uh, a sort of askance looks and, and turned up noses and, and things like that, uh, which especially, like I said, in, in your specific field, I think it's such a shame because you're literally doing what every other zoologist and explorer has done since, since we started categorizing animals. It's just that we have this group of people that think, oh, we're done with that. We've seen everything there is to see. Uh, and every year there's a story that comes out that proves that wrong. And yet here we are. Um, so, so I really, I do think that, that we, this branch deserves more scientific attention and more support than it gets. Uh, leave us ghost hunters out in the cold for a little while. I get it. <laughs> but the zoologist, uh, Bigfoot types definitely. Uh, so you guys can support Ken by, by picking up his book. Uh, I, there's so much more I want to talk to you about, Ken. I know we don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, Loch Ness Monster, is he a plesiosaur or is he something else? No, I mean, either really. I just that was always what I wanted it to be as a kid, right? You wanted a real live dinosaur still around. Actually, in one of my books, I write about a theory that it's a giant amphibian. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some type of amphibian as opposed to a reptile. I don't know specifically what form, but um, there are a number of biological reasons that that makes more sense. Um, there's another interesting theory. A guy once wrote a book about uh, theorizing that Nessie was actually a giant sea slug water slug hmm. and if you read a lot of the eyewitness descriptions people describe it as looking kind of like creepy and wormy and um you know mollusks uh mollusks basically have no size restriction they you look at the giant squids so, oh, I mean, they sure. have massive sizes and they can also live on the bottom of the you know deep in the water and not come to the surface a lot so it's, you know it's, it's fun to think outside the box but mm -hmm. um, i don't think plesiosaur is the answer just right. because there's a lot of zoological issues with that potential uh, theory. Well, they're definitely invertebrates. I mean, lobsters come to mind and things like that, where left to their own devices, we don't really know what their age span is because they just get yeah. bigger and get older. And so That's true. who knows? All right. Uh, aging is not, it seems equal across all species. Uh, no, that's, that's on my bucket list of places to go. Uh, a good yeah. friend of mine, I have a little bottle of water from Loch Ness and a rock. Uh, but I've never stood there myself and, and taken a look at it. Uh, so that's definitely one that, that I want to check out. It's a good one. Yeah. Uh, any plans on coming back to, to Louisiana anytime soon? Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of anything, but I, I, I love Louisiana. Um, you know, it's, it's near and dear to my heart. So hopefully mm -hmm. I, I will have a reason to be out there again real soon. Well, look, next time, again, next time you decide to, to explore Honey Island and you just want somebody to carry the gear, I'm your man. That's what I'm good for. Um, right. <laughs> I promise I won't take any shots at Bigfoot if we're hanging out together. I will abide by the Ken Gerhardt no kill rule. Um, 
I might ask you, are, are you sure we don't want to shoot this if we actually see one? But uh, no, that would be amazing. Uh, I've always wanted to go out to Honey Island. And in fact, as I said before we started the interview, uh, there are two friends really that I met through my wife who are interested in Bigfoot hunting. And so Big Thicket is, is kind of on the list. Oh, that's something. Um, in, I, know, I know you found them in Big Thicket, but in Honey Island, did you find any of the structures? The, uh, I, haven't found, I haven't found any there, no. Okay. Um, where was the one that you found them all pointed towards the, the water? That was in Florida. Oh, in the, in the, 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 in the, the skunk. The green, the, right. green, the green swamp. Looking for the skunk ape, yeah. right. Um, Similar habitat. Yeah. So I think this is one of the most compelling uh, kind of pieces of evidence that, that the public doesn't really know about are these structures that are found way out in kind of the unadulterated wilderness uh, that are effectively huts or sort of makeshift yurts or lean-tos that are out of branches that have been woven together uh, or leaned up against each other in ways that can't happen in nature but also don't seem to be uh, sort of functionally human. You know, if, you, if it was a person out in the woods looking for shelter, the shelters don't tend to protect against animals or part of the elements. They just seem to be some kind of phenomenon that's happening out there. Uh, and you've run across some of those. There's some great pictures in, in the guide. Um, but I think I've seen one of those uh, just wandering around the woods. And at the time, we figured it was just some person, you know, goofing around with branches. And then, you know, later on, I come back and I read these evidence uh, reports. And I think, oh, my God, no, I know exactly what that looks like. I've seen those same sort of, you know, young trees and saplings get woven together into this structure. Uh, so that's just fascinating. I was hoping you'd seen some in, in Honey Island so I could track them down. Uh, but maybe we'll have to go out to Big Thicket for that part. Yeah. Yeah, they're all over Big Thicket is, is what I hear. Um, excellent. Well, we did get, uh, we're going to do this backwards. Um, we did get a comment here at the very end that says, uh, I've missed it, but how did you first get into researching Bigfoots? So even I tried to avoid it. We're back to the same old question. <laughs> it's just been a lifelong passion. Yeah. I never had a sighting, but uh, when I was a kid, I, you know, I loved monsters. I loved uh, uh, animals, and I heard about Bigfoot, and I was just, you know, something clicked. I was just uh, fascinated with the subject. So, but I've been very lucky throughout my life that I've had an opportunity to pursue my passion for Bigfoot and other cryptids, and um, uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty much what I do full time. So I just feel very blessed to have had that opportunity. So. Well, we mentioned this again at the beginning, but, but you have a great adage that, that should be attributed to you. Um, and if, if you learn it from somebody, you got to pass it on. But this notion that even the worst day of Bigfoot hunting means what? You got to walk around in nature, in the woods with a bunch of your friends and hang out uh, and didn't see anything supernatural, but enjoy the day outside. And, and that's kind of life for us. Uh, that's it. Yeah. And being reminded of that was a was a good thing, especially in this quarantine time, because of course this is as much work as I get to do right now. Um, and the the drag of it is you, you start to consider at work. You think, oh, all right, I got to set up all this tech and get ready for Friday, etc. Uh, and I was telling my wife Ruby today, I said, you know, this week I don't feel it. I'm just excited, uh, and it has a lot to do with rereading that. Like, oh yeah, this is my life. You know, worst case scenario, uh, we get to explore this stuff for the rest of our lives and and never. Maybe never find the legitimate firm answer, uh, but certainly get to explore a bunch of mysteries along the way and, and have a bunch of experiences with our friends and appreciate nature and the larger world and, and mystery uh, sort of overall. So uh, by all means, if you're coming back this way, um, hit me up. I will. I'll carry all the gear if, if it needs to happen. Uh, <laughs> and you and Weatherly and everybody else can call me the kid and, and, and treat me like the low man on the totem pole. I'm absolutely all right with that. Uh, and by all means, if you and Annie are ever in New Orleans proper, uh, hit me up and we're going to connect you with, with all the good stuff. Uh, you're, you're part of the family now. So uh, with that in mind, let me, I'll throw it out one more time. I want to make sure any more questions, anybody? You got one more chance? And then we'll draw, uh, we're going to give everybody a chance because not everybody watches it when it's live. Um, so we'll give folks 24 hours to drop things into the, the tip jar and then we'll draw a winner. Um, yeah, so absolutely. Well, well, Ken, thank you so much. I mean, it really is. It's, it's amazing. Um, 
it, it's so strange to be not even one degree of separation from some of these people that I've been learning from and, and studying all my life. So you and Nick and, and David Weatherly and Lauren and, and the rest of them, um, it's, it's any, anything I do, you know, is standing on the shoulders of, of the giants that came before me. No pun intended when we're talking about Bigfoot. Uh, so, so thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. Um, by all means, if we do a second season, because God forbid we hit a second wave and we're all locked back up again, uh, but please come back on and we'll talk about Mothman and flying humanoids and, and all the other real high strangeness stuff. Uh, other than that, guys, Ken Gerhardt, uh, look him up on Facebook. Uh, buy all five of his books, but if you can only pick one, I think go with this essential guide because, like I said, it's, it's definitely the best jumping off point for anybody in the cryptozoological uh, fascination. So, oh, let me double check, and yeah, we're good to go there. Um, Ken, again, I, I don't know how to say thank you enough times. Thank you. This has been just really a dream come true. Uh, the honor is all mine, and um, hopefully we'll be able to, to kind of see each other in, in person as opposed to virtually uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, Sounds good. Well, it was definitely an honor and a pleasure to be here with you, James. Oh, and, shucks, uh, man. <laughs> thank you. Like I said. Everyone who, uh, thanks to everyone who joined in, and, uh, you know, hope everyone out there stays safe and uh, is feeling well. And, uh, That's right. Stay yeah. safe, stay healthy, keep searching, healthy. Um, and we'll see you all next week. Uh, hopefully next Friday we're going to have um, Calvin Von Crush, the occult collector, uh, on the show that's uh, dependent on phase one reopening, I think, in the state of Connecticut. So <laughs> depending on what Connecticut chooses to do. Um, otherwise, Ken, I'm going to come back at you, and we're, we're going to try to get Redfern to talk about men in black. No, I'm, I, that's that. No. <laughs> that's good. I love Nick. Thanks again, Ken. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, everybody, thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll catch you next week. Cheers, guys. Here I am typing, typing, typing.